Okay, in this video, we're going to discuss the electrical uh, New York City Energy Conservation Code requirements. So uh, it's abbreviated NYC ECC, and we're just going to discuss the electrical portion of that code. So we'll first discuss uh, when are the energy codes required for a particular project in New York City. Uh, there are some exceptions. And I'll discuss whether, you know, how to figure out whether a building is exempt from the energy code uh, requirements. Then we'll discuss uh, the sections in the New York City 2020 Energy Conservation Code, uh, which are required. And this basically means uh, once we get a particular project, there's uh, different sections of the energy code, one for residential, one for commercial. And I'll discuss when to follow each of those uh, code sections. And the main purpose of the Energy Conservation Code is to save on electrical consumption or energy cost for a particular space. So they have a lot of requirements on having automatic shutoff for lights. And to accomplish that, there's different methods. One is using occupancy sensors. So I'll discuss uh, the requirements uh, for those type of systems. They also have daylight sensor requirements. So based on the amount of daylight available, you have to be able to automatically dim or shut off the lights if there's enough natural light uh, provided for that space. There are also time clocks that can be used to automatically shut off lights. And in particular situations, you're required to use time clocks, and in some situations, you have to use occupancy sensors. So I'll go over when these time clocks are required. Then I'll discuss the energy power allowances, which basically states that for a given space, uh, there is a maximum allowed wattage that is permitted for the light fixtures. And there are different calculation methods to come up with this uh, energy power allowance. So I'll go over that in this video. Uh, there's also different methods of performing the energy analysis. There's something called ComCheck, which basically stands for commercial, and also ResCheck, which uh, stands for residential uh, spaces. And also there is a tabular analysis that can be done. So either one of these three can be used when doing the energy analysis. Generally, we're, we're going to use this uh, tabular analysis, but sometimes for newer buildings, the ComCheck or the ResCheck is used. And in some projects where it's requested by the client or architect or anybody else to use the ComCheck or ResCheck, for those projects, these would be used. But generally, we use the tabular analysis. Okay, so the first step is determining whether or not the project requires the energy code uh, requirements. So to do that, we have to see what the exceptions are for the energy code. And the main exception to this energy code is if the building is in a historic district, it is exempt from the energy code. All other cases, mainly it is required. So to determine whether a building is in a historic district, you could go to this website listed right here. And that website is this. So if I go back, you click this and it takes you to the landmark map. And this is the legend right here, which states that the historic district is in color yellow. The pink is individual landmark and this green is scenic landmark buildings. So any building that is within the historic district is exempt from the energy code. So there are all these regions right here in yellow that you see. So once you put in the address of the project and that building is in this yellow region, then it is exempt from the energy code. In all other areas, the energy code would be required. A historic district is also in a landmark area as well as these individual landmark areas represented in pink. So both the historic district and individual landmark areas are all considered being landmarked. So just because a building is landmark does not mean it is exempt because it could also fall under an individual landmark building 
uh, that would require the energy code. So only buildings that are in this historic district building would be exempt from the energy code. Uh, to obtain the uh, energy code for the New York City, uh, this is the website that you would use. And that basically would take you to this right here, this page here. And if you look here, this is the latest energy code right here. Uh, it's the 2020. So once you click this, you can see the latest version or the latest year uh, would be right here, 2020. And here are the uh, table of contents and two sections. The first one is for residential and the second is for commercial. Okay, so these are the two um, sections that you would basically apply to your project based on whether it's res considered residential or considered commercial. So to determine what is considered residential, uh, you have to go to the definition of residential buildings within the code. So I put the definition here, and you can also find it just by going to the definition section right here and basically finding the definition here. So the residential building uh, basically includes uh, detached one-family dwellings having not more than three stories above grade, uh, detached two-family dwellings not more than three stories above grade, buildings that consist of three or more attached townhouses, buildings that are classified in group R2, 3, and 4 have not more than three stories above grade plane, factory manufactured homes, mobile homes. So basically all residential buildings require this uh, residential code to be applied uh, that are up to about three stories in height. You can see here it's missing the R1, which basically is for hotels and motels that are used for transient usage. Uh, you also have this um, R4, which is for um, assisted living facilities, alcohol and drug centers, you know, halfway houses, things like that. Of uh, generally about, uh, I believe it's uh, six uh, people to not more than 16. So six to 16 people. And uh, buildings such as those type of rehabilitation type of uh, facilities would all fall under this R-4. R3 is one and two family dwellings, which again were mentioned up here. And R2 would be three or more family dwelling units. So basically this covers all dwelling units generally, uh, except for hotels and motels. So all spaces that don't fall under a residential building, according to this definition, would have to follow the commercial code section of the energy uh, conservation code. Okay, so for the electrical requirements in the residential section of the energy code, it's a very small section. Basically, all it is is this section right here. First, they talk about the lighting requirements, and what they state is that they want at least 90% of the permanently installed light fixtures to use lamps with an efficacy of at least 65 lumens per watt. And lumens just means the amount of light being um, outputted. And they want it to be at least 65 per watt of electrical input into the, um, into the fixtures. Or they want the total luminaire efficacy of at least 45 lumens per watt. So basically, you know, this is at least 90% at 65 and or a total of 45 lumens per watt. And all this data is on the spec sheet of the light fixture. So once you get the model number of the light fixture, you can look up this data generally within that specification and you'll be able to figure out if it meets the efficacy requirements stated here. This one talks about fuel gas lighting systems. Typically, this is not a very common type of lighting system, so I'm just gonna skip that. So this section here basically states that each unit uh, shall be separately metered. So each dwelling unit needs a utility meter, either from Con Ed, uh, which is the utility company in New York City, uh, for the electrical consumption for that unit. This section here now talks about electric vehicles. So, you know, the future seems to be heading towards electric vehicles. So they want to prepare for that. 
and the code requires that one or two family dwellings and townhouses with a parking area provided with a 208 240 volt 40 amp outlet and this is typically what is required for these uh, electric car charging at the higher rating and you have to provide either of these two conditions here so either a panel capacity and conduit for future installation of a 208 240 40 amp outlet for 5% of the total parking space but not less than one outlet so this is basically preparing the space for the addition of the actual outlet. And number two is providing the actual outlet, right? Uh, which is the two-way 40 amp outlet for 5% of the total parking space, but not less than one outlet. So uh, you either have to provide the outlet as in step two or provide the panel capacity and a conduit for the future addition of the outlet. Okay, now we'll talk about the uh, commercial requirements in the New York City Energy Code. And that section is in C405. So the residential starts with a R, anything commercial starts with a C. So section C405, and when you go to uh, that section, it's right here, C405. And something I wanna point out here is that um, you know, for the lighting section, uh, they state that dwelling units within multifamily buildings shall comply with section R404.1. So the residential section, since uh, it starts with OR. And this was the code section that I showed you in the previous slide. So basically this section right here, the R404.1. And it states that all other dwelling units, so a dwelling unit within a multifamily building just means it's two or more dwelling units, right? Uh, that's considered as a multifamily building. So all other dwelling units, uh, in my interpretation, would just mean a one family dwelling unit. So all other dwelling units, meaning one family dwelling unit, shall comply with section R404.1 or with these two sections here, which are in the commercial section. It seems as though from this statement right here that you could follow R404.1 for all dwelling units. And a dwelling unit just means a unit that has everything for sleeping, cooking, and sanitation. So a shower, a bathtub, a toilet. Uh, it has cooking, meaning it has a, f a full kitchen and a sleeping area. And if you have all three of those areas, uh, it is considered a dwelling unit. A hotel and a motel is not a dwelling unit or considered a dwelling unit since it doesn't have all three of those things. Usually it has a sleeping area and a sanitation area with a, a toilet, a shower, or a bathtub. But it doesn't have a cooking area. So sleeping units are the hotels and motels, and that should comply with the commercial section and this section right here, and with these two sections. So you have a choice. So basically, all dwelling units can comply with this R404.1. So if you go back to here, the R404.1 was just this small section right here, which means that you just have to make sure the lighting meets these efficacy requirements here. And if you look at the residential uh, definition, it states that all of these uh, dwelling units shall not be more than three stories above grade plane, as you can see here. Not more than three stories above grade plane. Not more than three stories above grade plane. Again, you see that repeated over and over in this section. Okay? So using the so if you look at both sections this section right here the commercial section where it states that all dwelling units can comply with r404.1 regardless of the number of floors and here it states that it has to be these type of dwelling units not more than three stories above grade plane so basically, all the different code sections that we just saw could be simplified to just state that all dwelling units can follow the section 404.1.
so for the electrical section in the commercial energy code, uh, we just covered this. Dwelling units uh, within multifamily buildings can comply with the residential section 404.1 uh, regardless of the number of floors for the uh, lighting requirements. Uh, all other buildings such as purely commercial spaces such as restaurants, let's say offices or schools, uh, we have to follow these other rules here. And I just briefly outlined it. Okay, so exit lights shall not exceed 5 watts per face. So you can have one face exit light such as this one here. Or this is a double sided exit light because you could see it from either side of the uh, signage. So for this one, the max would be uh, 10 watts because it's double sided. And this one would just be a 5 watt. So that's the uh, power limitation for exit signs. You also have these uh, automatic off systems and they can be accomplished with occupancy sensors, time clocks, and also daylight sensors, which I didn't label here. And they're used to automatically turn off lights and the lights have to be manual on. Uh, it can't be an automatic on system, but there are some exceptions where you can have an automatic on such as in uh, bathrooms and it's listed all in the um, energy code in the commercial section. Also, the, you have some uh, exceptions to these automatic off systems and the exception is uh, if the area are security or emergency areas that are required to be lit continuously, interior exit stairway, interior exit ramps and exit passageways don't have to comply with this automatic off system. Uh, emergency lighting that is normally off because it's normally off so you want to have to automatically turn it off and if you look in this diagram down here the exit stairway uh, that I mentioned right here is an actual stairway uh, which you see in buildings uh, interior exit ramps and exit passageways so exit passageways are these right here so it's the passageway from a space uh, to the exit stairway. So it's the path that you take to an exit stairway is considered the exit passageway. So in all those areas, uh, you don't have to comply with the automatic off system listed here using occupancy sensors, time clocks, and even daylight sensors. So we're going to talk about occupancy sensors now. There's two different types, or two main types, the PIR and ultrasonic. PIR stands for passive infrared, so it measures the heat. And ultrasonic is basically, it sends sound waves, and when it senses a disturbance in the sound wave because of some sort of movement in the room, it basically will uh, keep the lights on, and when it stops seeing any type of movement using the sound waves, then it'll basically automatically shut off the, the lights. And if there's both of those systems in a occupancy sensor, uh, it's called a dual technology type. Okay, and whenever you have a uh, area where there's obstructions, such as in bathrooms where you have stalls, or let's say a storage area where there's high shelving, then you want to use a ultrasonic type so it can get around those obstructions uh, rather than shutting off the system because it thinks nobody is there but they're actually behind that obstruction right so uh, generally by default you can just use a dual technology type which uses both of these type of uh, systems and if you ever want to just use a passive infrared uh, you should make sure that that space doesn't have any obstructions the energy code in this section right here 4521 uh, states the areas where you have to put the occupancy sensors. So they're all listed here. So classrooms, conference rooms, uh, some of the main ones are like offices, open plan offices, all these uh, areas such as restrooms. So they're all listed here as well as all other spaces not listed here that are 300 square feet or less uh, need a occupancy sensor. 
And if you look here, this is what an occupancy sensor generally looks like. You can have one uh, such as this. This one goes on the ceiling. And generally, they have this type of coverage. It's about 30 to 36, uh, depending on the specification sheet for that particular occupancy sensor. You'll be able to see the range that it operates within. Generally, I would space it no more than 30 feet apart. So in here, you know, I would just state that it's about a 30 by 30 square coverage. So basically, uh, it would be uh, maximum 30 feet between occupancy sensors and 15 feet max from the occupancy sensor and a wall. So that's a good general distance uh, to use when spacing out these occupancy sensors but you should always confirm it with the actual model number since they all differ in the range that it operates at. For this one here, this is uh, the typical ones that you can mount on a corner on a wall. So the range on this would look a little bit different than this one. It would look more like a picture like this where if you have the occupancy sensor right here, it would basically be good for a corner of a wall uh, using something like this. So this one is a occupancy sensor that's built into an actual light switch. So these are very easy to install and you know generally you could put these in small rooms like bathrooms or small offices. Okay so occupancy sensors uh, are required for the areas listed in uh, this section here 4052.1 which was basically uh, this section right here and this is the list of the areas that require the occupancy sensor. They are required to basically automatically shut off the lights within 15 minutes of no occupancy being detected and also it has to be manual on uh, rather than automatic on. So if somebody was to walk into a room, they would have to manually turn the lights on and it cannot be an automatic on, but there are some exceptions to this which are in the code. And if you look at the section, you could see that uh, the exceptions are right here. So for full automatic on controls, shall pe be permitted to control lighting in public corridors, stairways, restrooms, primary building entrance areas, and lobbies, and areas where ma manual on operation would endanger the safety or security of the room or building occupants. So these are some of the exceptions to that. And this section right here has to be followed for these areas right here. In open plan offices, cafeteria, dining areas, and fast food dining areas, 300 square feet or greater, you have to comply with another section. Uh, which is the one ending in point three. So this section deals only with these areas right here, open office areas, cafeteria, dining areas, and fast food dining areas that are less than 300 square feet, as well as uh, all other spaces specified in 405.2.1, which basically are all these areas here. So for all of these areas, uh, once you determine your space, if it falls under one of these areas here, uh, you would have to follow this. And basically all it states is you need an occupancy sensor to automatically shut off within 15 minutes and for it to be manual on. And if it is more than, uh, let's say 300 square feet, so 300 square feet or greater, and it is one of these three areas listed here, you would have to follow the section 0.1.3 right here. And generally it's the same thing, except that the controls have to be broken down with floor areas not greater than uh, 600 uh, square feet within the open plan office or dining space. So that's basically the main difference. You can also read through this to get all the details of the requirements. But that's the main difference uh, between those two area types. So I'm going to just kind of go over a basic wiring diagram for an occupancy sensor. So you have an idea of how it's wired. But on the plans, you don't really have to get this specific 
on the electrical plans, you would just have to specify that an occupancy sensor is required. And the electrician generally will pick a part that they prefer to use. Or if you want to specify a particular brand, you can uh, specify it on the plans. But these sensors are just very generic type. So an electrician might just go ahead and just purchase whatever manufacturer they like to use. And it should be fine. So for a typical occupancy sensor, you have a line voltage that's coming in right here and your neutral. So the neutral uh, basically gets spliced. It goes into this junction box right here. And the power goes in here. This is a splice. So it basically connects all the wires together that are inside the splice. So the power goes in here. Inside this, uh, you have basically a contactor that will then go right here and the power would then be sent to your load which is your light and then after it goes through your light it'll return back to your neutral and then complete the circuit so the power pack is basically just a switch right so it has this contactor which basically opens and closes the circuit and that opening and closing of that contactor is by all the controls that are going into this power pack. And those controls are basically represented by this low voltage wiring that you see here. And they go to this occupancy sensor. And also it goes to your uh, low voltage uh, wall switch right here. 